You might find it helpful. In fact, you'll find it very helpful, I hope, to turn with me to Acts chapter 2. That's page 1081 of the Blue Bibles, which you should see either in front of you or under the seats in front of you from the very front rows here. Turn with me, please, to that, because we're going to be looking at part of a a sermon together this morning. This is a sermon about a sermon, okay? Uh, I know that sounds a little bit Irish, but we've just heard something which did come out of Ireland. Did you know the Hallelujah Chorus was first performed in Ireland? before it even got to the UK. There you go. Uh, We need God's help as we look at the Bible together. Um, Before we say a prayer together, I've been asked by um, the guys who helped with breakfast this morning, and I know there are many of us were there. (laughs) This is so Lansdale Presbyterian. There's more food left, okay, basically. Okay, um, uh, please can you take your baked goods home with you? If you would not like your baked goods, there are Ziploc bags available. If you'd like somebody else's baked goods, you can take them home with you, okay? Um, Thank you indeed for everybody who helped this morning, and thank you for uh, just a great time together already today. Uh, Somebody joked to me before this service and before, uh, oftentimes during a sermon, I will say, nudge your neighbor. Give your neighbor a real nudge right now, okay? Especially if they've had breakfast this morning. Um, We need God's help as we look at the Bible together. Let's all pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much that we are here because Jesus is alive. And Father, we pray that this morning as we look at the Bible together, you by your Holy Spirit would speak to us and that we would understand more about what that means and the difference knowing that Jesus is alive makes to our lives. Bless us, we ask. We need your help and we ask for your help now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I actually come from Northern Ireland, um, and uh, for a a long time was involved in in different bits of of, uh, broadcasting with our church back in Ireland. And on one occasion, I had to do something for a production for a TV show um, in Ireland, um, where we went into uh, Belfast and did a survey, a vox pop, with a, we went out with a camera crew, and we asked people a very simple question. What do you think of Jesus? Now, I'm sure you can appreciate the answers were varied. Uh, some said never believed in him. Others would say he's just a man. Some people would say he's an example to follow. Some said, you know, he's the son of God. Maybe they came from a church background, but they, they weren't quite sure what that meant. Uh, one lady misheard me completely and said, well, personally speaking, I don't like wearing jeans. I prefer trousers. And, and we then had to explain to her what the real question was. But there was one answer which I remember very specifically. One lady turned to me and she said, oh, he's everything. I mean, he's the main man. Uh, what she was getting at was that, that he was absolutely everything in her life. That's the issue that many of us might have, actually, because why should Jesus be everything for us? Why? Um, You can see from Acts chapter 2 that that's actually the conclusion that people reach. Um, If you turn over the page, page 1082, you'll see there uh, Peter, who a few weeks previously had actually been denying that he even knew Jesus. He was pretending that he wasn't a disciple because he didn't want the the pressure that came with being associated with Jesus, who was on trial at the time. Peter is now boldly standing up in front of hundreds, thousands of people, it seems. And he says this in verse 36, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, that's Jesus, the risen Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So it's quite evident from Peter's point of view, Jesus is now everything. We're not quite sure what those mean, those terms. We'll talk a little bit about that as we look at this sermon together. But then the response of other people in the following verses seems that they get the idea that Jesus is everything. So you see there, um, verse 37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off 
everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Now, that word repent means a change of mind, a change of attitude, a change of direction. Everything changing. Um, Baptism was a public declaration of faith in Jesus. And we're told that on that very first day of Pentecost, or that very first day of the church, essentially the New Testament church, this day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes, about 3,000 people are added to the number that day. You can see that in verse 41 of our reading. Jesus is everything to these people. He's making a massive difference to them. But, but why should it? Many of us would say, I am a follower of Jesus, but actually the difference he makes to my life is minimal, or I struggle with certain areas. How can I make him everything over my temper? How can I make him everything over the stuff I watch on my phone or or on the screen? How can I make him everything over my parenting, or my marriage, or my desire to be married, or my desire not to be married? How can I make him everything over, and you fill in the blank. And some of us, we're not followers of Jesus here this morning. Can I say you are really welcome? It is just so good to have you, because what we are hearing today, I would suggest, is life-changing and is the most important news you will ever hear. Now, why can I say that? Well, let's look at this sermon together and see if we can find some of the answers. Um, We're in uh, Acts chapter 2, and uh, in the context, the Holy Spirit has come. It's the day of Pentecost. Uh, The disciples, the apostles, are able to speak in different languages to people who they've never met before in languages they've not learned, but they're understood by these people who come from these different countries. That's that speaking in tongues thing that's talked about here. And the point that people sometimes think of at this point, or sorry, is that, that at this moment, some look at the apostles and think, well, they, they're drunk. You know, they, they, they've been drinking. That's why they're making these weird noises. Uh, but Peter is explaining to the crowd, look, we haven't been drinking. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, what, are you, what you're seeing here is the promise of God of the Holy Spirit coming upon us. The promise that God made through the the prophet Joel about 550 years ago. God has poured out His Spirit on all kinds of people, regardless of your background, regardless of your uh, gender, regardless of your age, your social status. In these days or those days, promises God, I will pour out my Spirit and they shall prophesy. That means stand up and declare God's Word. And Peter's argument is that that's this day. That prophecy is being fulfilled at this very moment, y'all. He doesn't say y'all, but you get the idea. He's talking to this crowd and he's saying, these words are being fulfilled in your presence. And so in verse 21 of uh, of chapter 2, in keeping with them being in that day, It shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Who's the Lord? Good question. What does it mean to be saved? Excellent question. Uh, To be saved in this context means saved from God's just judgment. For the way that we as human beings have treated God. We'll say some more about that as we go through this passage together. How are we going to be saved? Well, by calling upon the name of the Lord. Who's the Lord? It's Jesus. And you're going to see as we look at these verses together um, under three headings, uh, time and again, Peter refers to this Jesus. And we'll see what that means as we go through these verses together. So there are actually three headings. They're going to shape our thinking this morning. This Jesus you crucified, God planned. That's from verse 23 and following. This Jesus God raised, and this Jesus God exalted. So that's the direction of travel. This Jesus you crucified, God planned. This Jesus God raised. And thirdly, this Jesus God exalted. Okay, so the first heading then, this Jesus you crucified, 
God planned. Look at verse 22, 23. I'm going to read them out to us. Men of Israel, says Peter, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. There's no doubt the historic figure Jesus of Nazareth really lived and really died by crucifixion. Even the most skeptical of theological scholars will not dispute that. When Peter says Jesus of Nazareth, therefore, everyone knows who he's talking about in this moment. Everyone can remember what they've seen over the previous months and years. No one disputes he did mighty works and wonders and signs in their presence. And, and that word choice of Peter's, incidentally, is deliberate. Uh, these were not conjuring tricks. This was not some sort of like illusion or anything like that. God was working through Jesus, says Peter. And yet, you killed this Jesus. Last phrase of verse 23, you crucified and killed by the hands of the lawless men. Uh, lawless men here refers to the Roman authorities. Um, they are lawless in the sense that they're outside of the Jewish laws. Uh, and they carried out Jesus' crucifixion. And, and they, they carried it out through what? Um, nailing him to a wooden cross through his wrists and his ankles. Particularly brutal form of execution, not even brought up in polite company by Romans themselves. But Peter's talking very directly to people from a Jewish background. You can see that from verse 22. He says, Men of Israel. And he says, You crucified and killed him. You may not have held the mallet that drove the nails into his body, but you as good as did. How? How so? Well, you shouted, Crucify, crucify all those weeks ago in front of Pilate, remember? You had the uh, arresting of Jesus. You had the mock trial. You saw him, and no one did anything about it. You are culpable. You are responsible for Jesus' death. And no one disputes, by the way, Jesus really was dead. There's no suggestion that he could have been revived in the cool of the tomb once he was taken down from the cross. He was dead, and you're to blame, says Peter. He doesn't mince his words, does he? And his words demonstrate the corrupt nature of human beings. You, you crucify the Christ. The word Christ means Messiah. Messiah means anointed one. Anointed one means God's king. And Peter says, you killed the Christ. You murdered the Messiah. Now, folks, bear in mind, these are good living people. These are the religious people of the day. They're in the temple. And Peter says, you're responsible for his death. And folks, we try and do exactly the same thing. You might not say, well, I don't want to murder Jesus. I don't want to murder the Messiah or crucify the Christ. And yet, what is it we do when we try and push Jesus to the sides of our lives? Marginalize him? Refuse to acknowledge that he is king over everything in our lives? We're, we're treating him as if he doesn't count, as if he doesn't matter, as if he were dead to us. But Peter's words not only demonstrate the corrupt nature of human beings, alongside that, verse 23, we can't ignore the importance of these words. Did you notice it there? This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Yes, says Peter, your actions are your real choices, your real decisions. They need to be set alongside the truth that God was at work in and through you at the very moment that you were doing what you did. 
Jesus was, we're told, was, was delivered up. Now, that means he was handed over or surrendered. Now, that could be referring to his betrayal and his arrest. More broadly, it could be referring to his suffering, his abandonment, his arrest, his mock trial, the torture, the crucifixion, the death. All of it, says Peter, was part of God's definite plan and foreknowledge. The cross is not a tragic, the cross is not a tragic accident. And all the way through the Bible, we see a similar kind of dynamic. People intending to cause harm and actively causing harm, but God using the very same intentions and actions for good. It shows how powerful and in control God truly is. The very thing that's aimed at bringing about the end of Jesus was being used by God to bring about the plan all along, His plan. So, folks, can I just say, as we can go to the next point, before we get there, the, the choices that you and I make are real. Uh, put it this way, it's no accident that you're here today. It's no accident that you're watching online or listening to a recording of this. God foreknew it. God planned it. Will you listen to him? So that's the first big point. This Jesus, you crucified, God planned. Next heading, this Jesus, God raised. We're going to read from verse 24 through to 32 here. God raised him up, that's Jesus up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and we are all witnesses. Uh, Three things I want us to note just as we look at these verses together under this heading, this Jesus God raised. First of all, Peter says that in the resurrection of Jesus, death is overcome. That's obvious in one sense, because Jesus rises from the dead. But in verse 24, Peter explains that God raised him up, Jesus up. Why? Because it was impossible for him to be held by death. Now, why is that? Well, it's because Jesus didn't deserve death. Um, we hear the word sin used a lot around here. You'd expect to. It's a church. But, but what does it mean? Well, um, some of you have heard this illustration before. We, we live with the mindset of Burger King. You know the BK title? Uh, BK, you can have it your way, you rule. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing new under the sun that might work okay with a burger, but, but when it comes to the Creator God who made us, we don't say we're in charge. It doesn't work. And that rebellion, which says it's my way, God, or the highway, which is essentially what sin is, that rebellion against God leads to death. Physical death, Moreover, spiritual death. Later on in the New Testament, another apostle, a guy called Paul, puts it this way. He says, the wages of sin is death. Our sin, our rebellion against God, earns us death. But, but Jesus was perfect, completely perfect. He doesn't deserve to die. He hadn't earned death. He didn't deserve those wages. Yet, he actively, 
voluntarily dies on the cross in your place and in my place. That, that's what's happening at the cross. He's dying in our place. He's paying the wages of sin. But, but look again at verse 24. We're, we're told here that death can't hold him. It's as if deaths in labor and, and the pangs of, 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 of labor pains are, are such that, that, that Jesus just can't, he overcomes it. Death is death dead. It's impossible to keep a good man down. It's impossible to keep the perfect Son of God down. A second thing to notice is that um, God raising this Jesus is in keeping with the Jewish Scriptures. Now, this is really important because here uh, Peter quotes a psalm from King David. This is Psalm 16. And it's significant because God had made a promise to David that one of his descendants was going to be on the throne forever. Peter refers to that in the sermon a little moment later on. That he's referring to places like 2 Samuel chapter 7. One of your descendants, God says, is going to be on this throne forever. And, and, and in Psalm 16, which is written about a thousand years before Jesus walks on the earth, David prays with confidence. You're not, verse 27, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. You'll not abandon my soul to Hades. That's uh, Sheol, the place of the dead. Now, in the first instance, it does apply to David in the sense that he's asserting God's going to protect my life. And many times that happens all the way through uh, David's life. God protects him. He looks after him. But here's the thing, says Peter. We all know that the patriarch, King David, ultimately died. In fact, if we were to go on a tour of Jerusalem today, if we were to go down, we could see David's tomb. We could open it up. We could do an exhumation. We could do the CSI DNA test. I know they didn't have CSI DNA test, but if they were able to, they could do it on the remains there. We could find the remains of King David. So was King David lying when he said that the Lord wouldn't let his Holy One see corruption? No. Uh, Peter's point is this, David is a prophet. He's thinking ahead. He's thinking ahead to this moment. Uh, think about what happened to Jesus. Um, we, we watched him die. We saw his lifeless body. We saw him wrapped up in those grave clothes. We saw him laid into a tomb. We saw a big stone put in front of the tomb. He was really dead. He was really buried. And here's the thing. God didn't abandon Jesus' body to the place of the dead. God didn't let his Holy One's body see decay. Conclusion, God raised Jesus, and in doing so, he is showing us that he, Jesus, is the long-promised leader that you need and that I need and that you need, and that I need today here in Lansdale in 2024. Jesus is the Messiah. And then Peter adds a third layer of, of evidence, as it were, in his case about how God has raised Jesus. It's in there in verse 32. This Jesus God raised up, and, and of that we're all witnesses. We've seen him alive. Several times we've eaten with him, we've spoken with him, we've touched him. Dead men don't do that. Ghosts don't do that. And the rest of the story of the book of Acts and the story of the church history demonstrates that Peter and the other apostles are so convinced that Jesus is alive that they are willing to die for their faith. With one exception, John the Apostle, who ends up in exile on an island and dies on that island for his faith. Conclusion, this Jesus, God raised. But that leads to another question, where's Jesus now? 
Why is Peter preaching and why not Jesus? Which takes us to the last part of Peter's sermon. Uh, This Jesus, God raised. This Jesus, you crucified, uh, God planned. This Jesus, God raised. And thirdly, this Jesus, God exalted. Look at verse 33 and following. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He, that's the risen Jesus, has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now here Peter quotes from another Psalm of David. This is Psalm 110. And it starts with God, that's the Lord, who's the first one that's mentioned halfway through verse 34 there, where it says, the Lord said to my Lord. So David is witnessing the Lord speaking to another Lord, my Lord, uh, sit at my right hand. He's not talking to David. David's watching this in his mind, as it were. He, he's saying someone being put in a position of supreme authority. And, and Peter's assertion is that the risen Jesus is that someone. He is the Lord. God says to this Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The right hand of God is the position of supreme power and authority. God says to the risen Jesus, rule from here. The implication of Peter's words are that Jesus has the God-given right to rule your life and mine. And now Peter also says, or he doesn't say it here, but we've seen him taken into heaven. You see that at the beginning of the book of Acts. And, and, And he is exalted by God to this position. Um, And and, and what we see here, too, is is that God has said, sit here in this position of complete authority until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, this is in the days of pre-lazy boy, okay? But but you you all know what a footstool is, don't you? Um, In in Ireland, we called it the pouffe. It was this little thing you put your feet up on uh, to rest. And and the picture here is of the ultimate and complete rule on the part of the risen Jesus. Anyone or anything opposed to him will be like a footstool for him. His rule is inevitable, not like Thanos and Guardians of the Galaxy or anything like that. Jesus' rule is inevitable and good. We would be foolish to ignore it. And we won't be able to escape it. Why? Because verse 36, let all of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, that's Jesus, both Lord, the one who's in supreme authority, echoing God's name itself, having God's name, and Christ, that long promised delivering king. This Jesus whom you crucified. You can be certain of it, says Peter. God's exalted this Jesus whom you crucified. Is it any wonder, verse 37, they're cut to the heart? They begin to realize what they've done. We murdered the Messiah. We killed the Christ. What are we going to do? If Jesus rules then he has the right to rule our lives in every way. That's why Peter says, repent. Stop going your own way. Go Christ's. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Some people say, you know, I'm too bad. I'm beyond God's reach. You don't know what I've done. I I may not have killed the Christ, but 
I've, I've killed. Maybe literally. Maybe that's the case with some people in this room this morning. But in my words, I assassinate. In my actions, I live as if people were dead. I've treated Jesus as if he doesn't really matter. He's a swear word. There's no way God can have me back. But, but remember who Peter's talking to. He's talking to people who quite literally did murder the Messiah. And he says, when you repent, you're completely forgiven. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And then he goes on and says, and you know what? You're going to enjoy what we're enjoying right now. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Tim Keller very famously put it this way. We, we are more wicked than we ever realized. But we are more loved than we ever dreamed. Think about that. You are more wicked than you realize. But more loved than you could ever dream. What will it mean for us to submit to this king today? You've heard me talk about this lady before, Queen Elizabeth II, one of the uh, biggest, most influential leaders of the, of the world in the last hundred years. At her state funeral in September 2022, at it, all of the world's leaders, presidents, prime ministers, monarchs were gathered in Westminster Abbey in London, and before her death, the queen, who was a follower of Jesus herself, she, she'd chosen all of the hymns and things that are going to be sung and the Bible readings that were going to occur at her funeral. Uh, they included um, a hymn entitled, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling, by a guy called Charles Wesley. And, and the last verse looks to the time when Christians are going to be with the risen Jesus, and it ends with these lines. Changed from glory into glory, till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. Now remember, this was chosen by the Queen of England. And this was being sung at Westminster Abbey in her funeral. And the choir was going. You can watch this on YouTube. It's extraordinary. The choir's going. The trumpeters are going. There's huge desk camps are going. And the TV cameras pan down onto the queen's coffin, her casket, which has the royal flag on it and a crown on it, her crown. And as the camera comes down, we hear the lords, till we cast our crowns before thee, not the queen, but the king, lost in wonder, love, and praise. Now, some people might say, well, Chris, we believe in the republic. Okay, but, but you get the idea here. Here was someone in front of all of the world leaders acknowledging who this Jesus is. What about you? If this offer is being made to the people who murdered the Messiah, there's nothing that can't be overcome by God. You are not beyond his reach. He can wipe the slate completely clean. It'd be wonderful if this Easter time you were to come to this Jesus. You want to find out more? Come along to our Sunday school class that Pastor Brian talked about a few weeks ago, uh, gospel-shaped living. See what living as part of this community is all about, but come and talk to me afterwards as well. Maybe today you know you've got to do business with this Jesus. Many of us would say we've taken that step. We are followers of Jesus Christ, but we're trying to work out what does it mean for him to be king over all of those different areas. But folks, if he has conquered death, if he has conquered the grave, if he has conquered sin, if he has conquered the hold that sin has, he can conquer what it is stopping you submitting to him as Lord in your life today. This Jesus, you crucified and God planned. This Jesus, God raised. This Jesus, God exalted. Submit your life to this Jesus today. 
Let's pray together, shall we? Maybe just take a moment's quiet before the Lord Jesus Christ. And in your hearts, quietly talk to him. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you that Jesus is alive. Thank you that you raised him from the dead. Thank you that he died for us. Thank you that his sacrifice worked. Thank you that he is exalted. Thank you for your spirit. Lord, how can we thank you enough? You are everything. Please would you help us to walk with Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior this week and always. Amen.